Hello, and welcome to On a Mission. This podcast is hosted by Mission West Virginia, a nonprofit organization located out of Hurricane West Virginia. Mission West Virginia changes the lives of youth and families in our state by recruiting foster families, providing life skills education, and creating community connections. As a reminder, this podcast represents the opinions of the podcaster and their guests. The content here should not be taken as medical advice. The content here is for informational purposes only. And because each person is so unique, please consult your healthcare professional for any medical questions. Hi, Cassie. Hey, Becky, how are you? I'm good. It's um, Friday. You excited for Friday? I am. You might not be listening to this on Friday, but if you are, just embrace that it's Friday whenever you get Yes. Yes. <laughs> Friday makes me super happy. Absolutely. Excited to spend the weekend at the house and maybe go. Ooh, yeah. I um, we're getting a haircut. Oh, that's fun. It'll be fun. It's been like four months. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. So, do you want to play Would You Rather? Always. Oh, I'm a little scared though. Are you scared? Why? Because I am not a good decision maker. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be fine. All right. So. It'll be fine. It and it's not life or death decisions. Okay. So, I mean, I guess it could be. <laughs> So the first one definitely could be. Oh Would you rather climb Mount Everest or be stuck swimming in the middle of the ocean for 12 hours? Oh, climb Mount Everest because I can't swim. You can't swim? I'm not very good anyways. I am 100% okay to swim in a pool where I can go from side to side, mm-hmm. but I'm not going to try to water. Okay. I'm a sinker. And gotcha. so it takes a lot for me to stay above water. I, I only can doggy paddle pretty much. So. Gotcha. I feel like I'd have a better chance of surviving Mount Everest than uh, being stuck. I'm very good at floating without using my legs or my arms. I just sink. I kind of bubble. (laughs) Um, So you would probably, what would you do? I would definitely do the ocean. Yeah, Yeah, definitely. Have you seen that funny quote that says, um, at every, every person who decided to climb Mount Everest, or it says, it says every body that was found at the top of Mount Everest at one point had a lot of motivation. Keep that in mind. Maybe calm down today. <laughs> no. <laughs> maybe you don't have that much motivation. Maybe that big thing that you're choosing to do, calm down. Calm down. <laughs> yeah. No. No. Would you rather never be able to have your own phone Ooh. or never be able to have your own car? Sheesh. I mean, we're kind of tied to our phones these days. I would say probably car. I mean, especially because with my phone, I can call an Uber now. Valid. Yeah, right? Yeah, right? I like I your logic. It, I can call it Uber nowadays, so... I'm going with it. I'm going yeah, with that, yeah, too. Yeah. yeah. I will miss a car, but there's also scooters and there's other things. buses, today. electronic bikes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. One more. <coughs> also, have lots of cars with, lots of cars with friends. <laughs> lots of friends with cars, so... Yeah, yeah, there you go. You use somebody else's car. That's right. Would you rather... Hold a tarantula or hold a hissing Madaga- Madagascar hissing cockroach. Hmm. I don't know much about cockroaches, but I don't like them. So, I don't like spiders either. So, one time my youth pastor dared one of the teens in his previous youth group to eat a hissing cockroach. Yeah? They did. 50 bucks. I would mm. not do that. Did you ever watch Fear Factor? Yes. It was one of their things. They yeah. always ate the the hissing cockroaches. Uh, I think that I would probably rather hold the cockroach simply because it, I don't know if they bite. No. Um. So their legs, <laughs> I've held them. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. So their legs have little like hairs that kind of feel like they're pricking you okay. as they're walking, okay. but they don't bite. See, I'm, I'm a feared. A feared. My mom always said a feared instead of scared. I would be a feared that uh, something would like spook this spider and it would somehow like jump on me yeah. or attack my face. Mm-hmm. For the cockroach, I'd just be like, oh, you're scary. And then they would put it down and it wouldn't be a big deal. So yeah. I yeah. I definitely go with cockroach because I don't like spiders at all. I used to actually like collect spiders for the zoo when I worked there. Um, but then I got bit by a spider in my shower oh, and it, yeah, it, like, I got over my fear of spiders to then just get scared of them again. Mm. So. Is it arachnophobia? Is that fear yeah. 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 I mean, I'm not so bad that, like, I would burn down my house or something. <laughs> but I'm Still good to kill it fan. if I see it. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. sure. So, um, today we're going to talk about personalities. Yes. And our color personality lesson that we go over with students. Um, 
Do you want to start off with who you are and what you do? Sure, yeah. My name is Cassie Crowder, and I am an educator here with the THINK program um, now almost three years. Becky and I actually started together. Yeah, same day. Uh, Same day, same year, all that good stuff. Um, And I am on the sexual risk avoidance education side of things, um, which really isn't much different than any other grant we have. We teach very similar curriculum where our goal is to um, help teenagers realize their worth. And I'd say that that's probably my favorite thing about my job, which is helping teenagers realize that they can make smart choices and they can have positive futures. So um, this is one of my favorite lessons to teach. It's our second lesson. So we teach 13 lessons in our curriculum. Um, where we start out with learning more about themselves and then um, lead into positive decision-making skills that is anywhere from who your friends are to withholding from certain activities such as sexual decision-making and and avoiding drugs or alcohol. So this is really the beginning of all that good stuff and helps them realize who they are. I like the fact that we um, help students realize who they are before we tell them how to have a healthy relationship yeah. because if you don't know who you are, how do you know how you're going to react to certain situations? And in this lesson, we also talk about baggage, which we won't dive into in this podcast because that's just too much to get into. But I love that we start off with baggage early on in the lessons to help them because I think a lot of times young people, especially in their very early formative years, struggle with who they are and they try to try to find that in their relationships Mm -hmm. right so they go through a lot of really rocky up and down relationships because they're trying to figure out who they are through those relationships and that's just it can be very damaging it can add to their baggage yeah (laughs) and uh definitely uh, because i would say that my baggage that i have personally when it comes to um just me in general i i had a very good childhood Um, But a lot of my baggage came from friendships and relationships that weren't great. Right. Um, That I just kind of, nobody told me what a good friendship or good relationship was. Mm -hmm. And and so a lot of my friendships, especially, not even necessarily my romantic relationships, but a lot of my friendships were very toxic. And I didn't know that. Right. um, I had a couple of those as well, and I didn't realize it. And I was so caught up in the person and who they were and what they thought of me that I couldn't see what they were doing to me. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. good. Yeah. And so one of the things I really enjoy about this lesson <laughs> being early on as well is that it is about friendships too. You know, mm-hmm. we, we go in there and I love our program title is THINK, which is an acronym for teaching health instead of nagging kids. And I, and I, I say that often throughout the curriculum that I'm not there to nag them. And by starting off with things like personality color tests and other activities that are fun but also informative – and really almost revolutionary for them, um, I think that helps them realize that we aren't there to nag them. We're just yeah. there to help them understand um, that they are themselves. And, mm-hmm. and embracing who they are is super important. And, and that really does help in your relationship. Yeah. <coughs> so. Okay. So. Let me tell you a little bit about how the personality color test works. Yeah. Okay. Tell me all about it. So it's by Dawn Billings. Um, and so you actually have to get kind of approval to use this in our curriculum, which we have. Um, and so it's the primary colors. There's six colors that we discuss. It's red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and purple. So, so all the colors of the rainbow. rainbow. That's right. Um, and one of the things I actually teach when I teach this personality color test is that um, all colors of the rainbow are important. So there's not one that is better than the other. And, and that's actually one of the slides is no one style is better than the other. And I think sometimes we kind of get caught up in wanting to be somebody we're not. Um, so we start off um, with the personality color test by having them switch their dominant hand to the other hand with a pencil. So if they're right-handed, like, we have them go left. So I would have to go left-handed since I'm right-handed. I cannot write with my left hand How very well. How would it look? If you were to write right now with your name, with your left hand, if you're, it, if you're a listener right now, take your pencil, <laughs> take something with you, with your right-handed, switch it to your left, and I want you to write your name. Yeah, it's horrible. Yeah. Like... Um, I have done that and it looks like a child's writing and you can't really make out the words or the letters very well. Yeah. How'd it feel when you, when you, awkward. Yeah. I mean, even thinking about it right now, like I don't have a pencil in my hand. I'm going to grab one. Um, it feels like I don't even know how to hold it properly. Right. And that's, that's kind of where we get at with them is that when you try to be somebody or not, it's awkward. It feels weird. It's uncomfortable and it never looks as good. Of right. course, you have the one kid who's ambidextrous. So it's like, oh, well, it's fine to me. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the majority understand, oh, 
maybe that's pretty accurate. And mm-hmm. when you try to be somebody you're not, when you don't embrace your natural tendencies of who you are and, and what you do, um, it's just not as good. And, and so one of the things that I try to preface with as well when I teach this um, is that when we do these personality color tests or, or personality tests in general, it's not to almost speak that personality into existence, into your life, or almost like put them in a bubble. Rather, it's just to help them embrace their natural tendencies. Yeah, self, self-awareness. Self-awareness is a great way to put it. And, and through self-awareness, you can really build a lot in teenagers. You can build them up. You can help them um, become better at their skill set and, and really help them hone in on um, what their skills are. You know, as a young person for me, and still as an adult, sometimes I struggle with what am I good at? Rather, I, I try to shift their focus of what are you good at to what can you embrace in your individuality that can make you more awesome in all areas of your life. Yeah. Because all teenagers have skills. Um, all people, all human beings have skills. And, this and is our skills like, may be different, but we need to embrace who we are and what skills we were given or have learned over the years. Absolutely. And so one of the ways we actually discuss active personality tests, so let me let me back up for a second and tell you a little bit about the color personality test. So okay. there's seven rows and um, on each of the rows, there's different adjectives that they will read. And so there's six different adjectives they'll read and they will rank them from six to one. So six is the most like them. One is the least like them. We have them focus on their extremes first because those are the easy ones to spot. Right. Which is the most like me, which is the least like me. And then you just kind of fill them in. Um, So five is kind of like you. Four is beginning to be less like you. Three, somewhere in the middle. Two, somewhat not like you. One is the least like you. Gotcha. Every row will have six through one. Once they fill out horizontally, left to right, six through one on each of the seven vertical rows, they add up all of their colors and whichever color has the highest number is the color that they most likely resonate with. Gotcha. Oftentimes you'll see with young people that they have pretty similar numbers across the board. They usually have one that's higher and one that's really, really low. And so we try to help them focus on the ones that are, the one or two that are higher. Um, and just help them realize that those are the ones that are going to help them understand more about their personality. So why do we talk about personality when it comes to relationships? That's a great question. A lot of teens <laughs> are like, what do we about personality color? Right. Like, well, what does this matter? Yeah. One of the things that really helps within relationships is it's kind of, uh, we, we teach that it teaches four things. It helps you develop yourself. It gives you humility and tolerance, and it helps relationships. And so we teach this idea that there's a centered version of yourself and there's an extreme version of yourself. And so when you're centered, that's when you're happy, things are going well, you don't feel stressed, you don't feel anxious. In general, that's when your centered qualities shine. But then each of us have extreme tendencies. Right. Each of us struggle through stress, anger, frustration, things just not going well. And in in those cases, our extreme qualities tend to come out. And so we have to be careful and cautious and cognizant of what those extreme tendencies are because they can damage relationships. Gotcha. So extreme, extreme tendencies, what, what, give me an example. Okay. So I will tell you what I am. Okay. So an orange personality is someone who is kind of like um, the life of the party. And Mm -hmm. so I've got my personality test here in front of me. So it says the major strength of an orange personality is that you help people have fun and try new things. And and Becky knows me. Yeah. She said it's pretty accurate. Pretty uh, accurate, myself, yes. Right? I, I love to have fun and I love to help people. And I out. want to be an orange. No. So bad. No. <laughs> okay, so here's here's what's interesting about you saying that. As an orange, I don't always love being an orange. And so something about our personalities is that sometimes we look at other people and think, man, I wish I could be more like them. And what this personality color test really does is help you understand that we need, again, all colors of the rainbow. Because here's the mm-hmm. reality. You would not... What color are you? I'm a yellow-blue split. Like, literally right one point... Okay. Yeah, difference. I'm one point difference between orange and yellow. So, for the listeners, yellow personalities, greatest strength is gentle and understanding. Blue personality is greatest strength is that you're organized and focused. If you were to see my calendar compared to Becky's calendar... They're very different. <laughs> it's something that doesn't come natural to me or the organization skills. I can fake it till I make it and make it look like I know what I'm doing, but I struggle with organizational skills. So sometimes I would look at people that are blue personalities, like Becky and my husband is also a blue personality. I'm like, man, I wish I had that skill set. And you think, you think the same yeah. thing about me sometimes with orange. And right. So one of the things I tell people is that, like, for an example, as a blue personality, you would be somebody I would look to 
to help me plan something, right? Don't come to me as an orange to plan anything because I'm going to be chaotic and all over the place. Come to you as an orange to host it. Absolutely. And so one of the things I help them realize is that, you know, it's not necessarily a bad thing to look at someone and think, man, I wish I had more of that. But instead, learn to embrace those skills and work together. Instead of wishing you were more like that person, instead, work together with them. So right. As a blue and an orange, we would make a great hosts. Right? Yeah. You would be the one to do all the planning and the decorating and all and the I things. And I prefer to be behind the scenes when it comes to that stuff. Sure. And I think that's just my personality. Yeah. Like, I, um, and I'm, funny thing you said about organizational skills is I have organizational skills when it comes to my work. When it comes to my home, it's chaos. Yeah, I get that. So I don't know. I mean, if you walk into my house, you're not going to find, like, stuff just... You will find, like, dog toys and child's toys everywhere. But everything kind of has a place. Sure. But it's not necessarily the best place or best way to organize things. So I get that a lot in the classroom. And especially because you're one point away, right? Mm-hmm. You're blue and yellow. So what a, lot, what a lot of times I'll tell students is to retake this test with two different mindsets. In the classroom, we don't have time to take it twice. Um, but actually on the website for this color personality test, I was looking at it yesterday. And when they do this with adults, they actually have them take it twice. And once with the mindset of who am I at home and once with the mindset of who I am at work. So that's different. Yeah. Oh. Um, so what would be very interesting is that I almost guarantee you're blue at work and yellow at home. Mm-hmm. So your organizational things need to be in place. I'm very curious. Want to figure out how things work. Blue personality shines through your work, yeah. shines through your skill set at work. But your yellow, nurturing, caring, kind tendencies shine at home. I would say that's probably accurate. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say probably similar with my orange and yellow. Um, That my, because also my home is also chaos all the time. Um, But I don't have any blue or purple personality at all in me, which are the two. (laughs) Blue and purple are the two that are the more organizational work focused. Um, But I would say definitely, if I'm thinking work focused, I'm probably more of an orange personality, which is the one that kind of is, I'm going to, make things happen. You know, I'm not naturally a leader, but my orange personality makes me look like a leader simply because I like to try new things. Right. And I like to help other people shine. And I think that helps you in the classroom because you can project this excitement and love for what you do to the children. And those teens can then pick up and go, oh, like she really cares. She's passionate about this. I feel that from her. She cares about me. Sure. Sure. And, and I'd say the yellow personality can even shine for me when I'm in those interpersonal situations with the student in the classroom. So right. In front of the class, I'm all, woo, fun, let's talk about this thing. I'm passionate. You want to listen to me because I'm passionate. Um, but then when they come to me personally, that yell, I can almost flip that switch of, okay, my, my nurturing, kind, caring personality. I now become out. the mother personality, the, sure. the parent figure sure. to kind of guide. and. Yeah, absolutely. So. Mm-hmm. Um, now, here's what I'll say about that blue personality. I think it probably, when you say I'm organized at work, but not so much at home. And so let's talk about that centered extreme tendency for a second. Um, one of the downfalls of, or I wouldn't say downfall. That's the way this word's this. We actually talked about this in our training last week, but let's say more things, areas of growth. Right? Yeah. One of the areas of growth for a blue personality is the, ten- the tendency to be a procrastinator and a perfectionist. Yes. Yeah, yeah, right? <laughs> yes. I'm married to one, so I I'm get it. Both. <laughs> um, and so what that looks like is because you want things to go so well, often you will put them off mm-hmm. for as long as you can because you don't want to mess up and yes. you don't want to do it well. Yeah. And so that's just an area of growth. And it's something that one of the things I really try to emphasize when I teach this lesson is we all have things we need to work on. We all have things that we're maybe not so great at in our personalities that and I love that word areas of growth because it's it's not to say you won't ever be able to be good at this, but because it doesn't always come naturally to you. And it's you got to work on it. Yeah. you got. For me, like Orange Personality says, one of the things you got to watch for is you can communicate well when you take the time to do it, but you need to work on slowing down to really listen to others. And I, I read that, I'm like, oh, I suck. I don't. I don't stink at, at that. I just, this is something that I, I got to work on. Yeah. You just got to be mindful of what you're doing and what you should be doing in order to provide the best feedback. I mean, yeah. really, I, it's all about listening and intently to provide feedback is is key in those situations. But, like, I'm not good at that either. Like, I'm really bad about if somebody is just talking, 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 
that I just zone out sometimes. And it's horrible that I do that, but let me, let me I read do. You very, <laughs> let me read you your very first relationship uh, area of growth. Okay. It's a bloom. Sometimes you don't communicate your feelings because you can't find the perfect way to do it. <laughs> you sometimes think too much about things. Yeah, That's definitely. Describe, yeah. Right. And so yet again, I think, and I, we give them these to keep. So that way they don't have to try to remember all this. Right. Um, and, and it really kind of flows right alongside baggage because we discuss this in a way of why these personality traits, both your areas of growth and the areas you're really kind of exceed at. Um, matter in your relationships. So recognizing that about yourself is huge for a relationship. You know, um, both of us are married and have been for a few years now. Um, yeah. And, and quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. 2006 so, for me. It's been a long time. Okay. Okay. 2015 <laughs> for me. Um, Sunday will be six years. And so happy anniversary. Oh, but what's very interesting is that, you know, this curriculum that we teach, I started teaching after I was married. And it's helped my relationship as a married person dramatically because I can recognize when, um, you know, my husband is someone who, as a blue personality, uh, often shuts down when things get emotional or when he's not sure how to communicate. <laughs> yes. He's like, this is me. Um, and so me as an orange personality is like, let's just fight it out. But I just learned to recognize that through my major areas of growth, which is I want to communicate, communicate, communicate that I need to sometimes sit back and give him time to, to figure think. out how he's going to communicate how he feels. And that I don't need to know right then and there yeah. how to fix the problem. And that sometimes we just need to be apart so that he can work on all of those things that are in his brain, area of growth, and mm-hmm. it's time to figure it out. And I, as an orange, <laughs> need to take my time to back away so that I can give him time and give him space. So it really does. So there's four things, four reasons why we teach personality. It helps you develop yourself. So it helps you understand more of yourself and how to embrace and be mindful of that word you use, Becky. Yeah. Um, but then really how it gives you humility and tolerance. So I'll humility. Give you a... I like that. Because, yeah, uh, I mean, I guess if you know who you are, you can kind of like just take that in and be like, oh, well, this is just this is just me and it's OK. Yeah. I, yeah. And I love that. You know, it's that idea of it's OK to not be OK comes alongside knowing who you are and embracing that and, and being willing to sometimes say, I need help. Yeah. Um, because I am so bad at that. Uh, me too. <laughs> That's our yellow personality. Yeah. So yellow personalities are, let me just give an overview really quick of what all the different personalities are. Okay. Just so that way. Listeners can kind of. To them. Yeah. You'd be like, what the, she keeps saying the blue, she keeps saying purple. So there's six. The red personalities have a need for power and control. They're often your leaders. They're the people you're going to see in charge. Your CEOs, um, your pastors, that kind of thing. People who are going to um, yeah, be in charge, so take control. So, yeah, like you said, it, it maybe we're even like a manager or an owner of a company. Right. Um, or even president. A lot of the presidents are probably naturally red personalities because they have a natural leadership quality. Orange personalities are unique for attention and excitement. These are going to be people who get things going. The party. The, the party, partiers. The party people. Um, often going to be either in theater, news, center stage, somebody who's going to be willing to, or teachers a lot of times. Media, maybe. Any place where they're probably going to have opportunities to shine, that's a lot of times where oranges are. Yellow personalities have a need for approval. These are your nurturing, kind, caring people. So a lot of times teachers, nurses, any any position where they have an opportunity to. Child care workers, youth services, like social workers. Most of the social workers are new or yellow. Absolutely. Yeah. Because they have that just natural tendency to want to take care. Green personalities are a need for harmony. Now, this is the one that's the hardest to kind of explain to young people because uh, you don't see a lot of green personalities in the classroom because it's one that kind of develops over time. It's one that it, it, it's often people who are into uh, political standing or people who want to see, they see the big picture kind of thing where they want the little people, the people who often get kind of shoved under, they want to see those people rise up. So mm-hmm. it's often people who are in humanitarian positions, but you don't often see young people in that position yet because they're still growing. Um, so you don't see a lot of greens in the, in, the, in the youth, but you often see it as once they reach kind of like college, college mm-hmm. where green personalities usually come out a lot stronger. Okay. Because they start to really understand what their ideals are. Blue personalities have a need for order. They're very... Curious people. <laughs> These are your graphic designers, computer programmers, engineers. Yeah. They want to tinker with things and figure out why they work. Yeah. Um, 
purple personalities have a need for accomplishment. So these, a lot of times, are going to be uh, your people with numbers um, because they like to see a plan come together. So my husband is a purple blue. Okay. Okay. He's here. Yes, yeah, he's an, he's a systems admin and manages like 182 servers at his work. It's a lot. Um, so need for order and accomplishment. Yes, so he sense. has a list. He knows exactly sure. like step by step what the project should look like, what steps he needs to take, what steps other people need to take. He's very detailed when it comes to that stuff. And I would say he used to be just like that for vacation. He okay. wanted to right. have a plan. We're going here. We're going there. We're doing this. We're doing that. We're going to get there in this time frame. I mean, we're driving to Florida. It's a 14-hour trip. Driving, he wants to get there in 15 with sure. like 15-minute stops only, and that's it. Sure. But over time in our marriage, he's kind of let me, my personality kind of shine through, and he's learned to appreciate like low-key vacations sure. where you kind of just take your time to get somewhere. You can stop randomly if you see, like, the largest peach stand in the right, world right, or whatever right, that right. just one of those random sure. tourist attractions. Um, he's learned to appreciate that, and he loves it. Yeah. It's so yeah. different from what his normal everyday is that he's like... It's a break. Yeah. It's almost like yeah. a mental break for him. Yep. Sure. And I would say, you know, one of the things that my husband and I have learned about each other over time, and this is what uh, a lot of times I get teenagers who will ask me either in our anonymous question time or we get the opportunity for them to ask me blindly kind of um, questions or even they'll ask me in class, well, if I'm a yellow, what personality is best for me to date? Well, there's really not one that's better for you than others. But what is really important when it comes to personality is just understanding each other. Yeah. And I always tell them when they, speak, they get to take these home is have your partner take this test or right. have your best friend or have your parent because it gives you a tolerance. So that's the next thing I was going to kind of lead into. And, and your story really kind of leads me into that idea of tolerance. It gives you tolerance, not only in your romantic relationships, but also in all different types of relationships. So if you start to understand, and this is something that was huge for me as an orange, because I'm just different than purples. Right. <laughs> so to give you an example, um, as an orange personality and yellow, you know, those are my two together. I tend to get along with most people. It doesn't take much for me to be like, you're my best friend. You know, mm -hmm. I love you and, uh, you know, we're going to be buds. It doesn't take much for me. And I know that that's not always the case. Like, we're a blue personality. It's going to take yeah. some while to open up. That's just who I am. And, but at my last job, there was this person that, like, nails on the chalkboard. Right. I mean, it was just like, I could not, like, she would do things that I would just be like, I'm going to go. Um, lunch because I just needed to get away and we worked in the same office so I was like I've got to do something and before I had this job um, one of our other educators was teaching this curriculum to a group that I was helping with and I took this personality test and she was discussing tolerance and, and, and understanding that that person who you can't stand is just probably different than you and it was like like light bulb mind, like, light bulb to me like yeah that's why we don't get along and maybe there's something that i'm doing that's not driving her crazy yeah and so what i realized was i was legit driving her crazy too because she was somebody so at my last job i did um career services so i would help um young people find positions and so my job was to travel around and um find these positions for students and her job was to do the paperwork and and to get signatures and to keep all these young people on track and kind of on focus. Mm -hmm. And so as somebody who didn't have a plan, me, and I would just go out and do stuff, that drove her crazy because she needed to know what you were doing, what I was doing. And she also needed paperwork. So right. I would often go to a place that maybe she needed a signature from, but not tell her I was going there and because I would just stop in. And what I started to realize was she needed my chaos to be in order. And I needed that too and from her. And so I started to recognize there were things that we could do better together. And so the next day I went in and I think it was a Sunday. It was a Wednesday night that, um, that I was, I kind of learned the personality test. And I think I went in the next day and I was like, Hey, to my coworker, I was like, how can I help you? Today? And she just looked at me like in amazement, like dumbfounded. Like, like what? Hold on, <laughs> wait, you're asking me this? And every day I would go up to her and be like, Hey, how can I help you? Today? What do you need? And it helped me make more of a plan, which we've already discussed. I'm right. not always the best at and it helped her be able to mark off her checklist and keep track of her checklist. And so from then on out, we were really good friends and we worked so well together and we're still friends. And, and just that simple idea of understanding. Yeah. I'm completely different than this person. Mm -hmm. So 
where I'm driving her crazy, she's probably driving like I'm. She's driving me crazy just as much. And so give me tolerance to understand her strengths are not mine. Right. So also at my last job, I um I had a director. I had. I had several bosses when I was there, but one of the last ones, next to last bosses that I had, marketing director, very much a red personality. Okay. All right. Very much a red personality. And she wanted to dictate what I did wow. every day, but I had been doing this job and getting requests from, you know, literally anywhere from like 800 different people a day from volunteers, from other staff members, different departments, et cetera. I had to process all these requests and she wanted me to do anything that she sent me first. Sure. And it threw, I literally would block off time for each task Mm -hmm. on my outlook calendar. Mm -hmm. And so it threw my calendar completely off every single time. And I was working 80, 90 hours Mm -hmm. a week just to get the job Mm -hmm. done because, and so we clashed a lot. Sure. And eventually I realized she just had this need to, like, she needed to know how my schedule was and what I was doing at all times in order to understand that I couldn't just drop things. Sure. So every day I would go in and say, I'm working on X, Y, and Z today. My deadline for this project is this day. And here's where I'm at on it. And this is the amount of time I need. Do you need anything before I start working on that? Mm. And that changed everything, everything. And then it was like we worked together on my calendar and she like understood where I was coming from. She understood all the requests that I had coming in. Before that, I didn't have somebody that needed that control. It was just I just managed my own schedule and I would get things and um, say the boss would send me something to pull together a report on. And they would say, I need this in three days. And I would just plug it in whenever I needed to. But her personality was very different. She wanted it immediately, which meant I had to drop everything. And it just, it threw my whole world into chaos. And so I had to learn how to work with her. And eventually we did. Like, we worked really well together after I realized, like, she had this need for control. She needed to know X, Y, and Z. And I needed to provide those to her so that... We could be on the same page. Yeah. So if you look at those color personalities again, so let's just compare both of our situations with people we work with, right? So as a blue, you had a need for order, Mm -hmm. your calendar. As a red, you had a need for power of control. Yeah. Knowing what you were doing. Right. And so when you were able to build that tolerance and humility, you, it really dramatically helped your relationship. Yeah. For me, I have a need for attention and excitement, which was me being something different every day. And she had it as a purple, she had a need for accomplishment. She wanted tasks to get done. Right. And so for us to work together, it was, I have a little bit of order for her, um, but that gave me excitement because she would help me with making sure that every day looked different. So right. it really does build humility and tolerance, which can really help relationships. Right. Yeah. And so it, it really um, can help teens. And, and so another thing I just want to say is I feel like every relationship is a choice. And maybe that's just me, but I feel like it's a choice to love somebody. I feel like it's a choice to tolerate somebody's personality traits or styles. We have the ability in our our own selves to make those choices and to realize like you can't control everything, but you can choose to accept it. Sure. Yeah. And so one of the things that we kind of hit on and your communication is two of the lessons we eventually get to in our curriculum. And one of the big parts of communication that I try to emphasize is compromise. Mm -hmm. Um, That there's going to be a lot of times where, um, you know, there's, and we also discuss expectations in the next lesson after uh, personality color tests. And that's something that I also hit on the idea of compromise, that you want to make sure that you and your partner, you and your friends, people who you're close to in life, the big things matter, Mm -hmm. you know, things that matter really deeply to your heart. And so maybe you should consider religion and politics and family and these big subjects to make sure you and your friends and partners are on the same page for those big things. But the rest of the stuff, you find some compromises, um, yeah. you know, and, and it really does matter to find a compromise. And, and so if you and your friend or you and your partner are having a big argument, big fight, or you and your boss are having a big fight, 
um, it takes a decision to find a compromise. And right. so one of the big things I had, a, <laughs> I had a student one time who was a red personality. It was not shocking. So one of the things I love about this test is a lot of times when I start reading off what each of these personalities are, you usually get friends who look at each other and laugh. Because mm-hmm. it's just like, it, it's they just know team, who right? you are. Yeah. Yeah. So I had a team who was a red personality and he knew it. And we were discussing finding compromises. He was like, well, I always have to win a fight. I was like, you don't always, though. Let me let me give you this kind of brain-blowing moment that as a right personality, in your relationships, it's going to be a big struggle for you. Yeah. Um, that sometimes fights aren't about winning. They're about finding a solution to a problem. And he could not embrace that. And I was like, I'm just going to tell you now, for all your future relationships to help them, you're going to want to work on that skill. Right. And it's an area of growth. I, I still, I wish I would have had that term for the last two and a half years of my teaching because I would use the relationship pitfalls is what the curriculum uses the term as. Um, but I love that areas of growth. And, and it is going to be hard for him. Yeah. As a red personality to lose. Right. That's not something that's in there. I dynamics. mean, I'm a blue yellow and I hate to lose. Yeah, yeah. I hate it. Not it a lot of people I like want it. to, I want to fight my battle as long as I sure. can fight it. But also because I'm caring and compassionate, I want the other person to win as sure. well. So, I had to learn how to how to manage that in life. Yeah, my orange, a lot of times you and your uh, second color can be in conflict sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, so like orange personality is very need for attention and excitement. Yellow is that nurturing. So what I do have, I think that's where I got to, at least now. When I was in, in high school, it was a lot harder for me when I played sports to accept another team winning. Um, right. But now, as an adult, and seeing just a lot more and knowing a lot more, it does give you that humility to... Um, that yellow personality kind of equals out the orange of, hey, it's okay for somebody else to win. Right. And I want them to feel good about it. And, you know, especially when somebody who, I would say, you can, deserves the win. You can more, also do the, you have more reasoning skills yeah. so that you can. Yeah. So speaking of the brain, <laughs> I love the brain. Okay. I love it. I think it's fascinating. I studied sociology in college, but part of me wishes I. I didn't go into psychology because I'm not very good at understanding science. Mm-hmm. Uh, I tend to like the sociological side of things better. Um, but psychology, psychology and sociology tend to work hand in hand. And so I've done a lot of research on the brain. And I found this Harvard study that was posted by the Business Insider that said that the age your brain matures at everything. So it's this, it's this entire scale from age 5 to 67. And so okay. Here's what's interesting. At the age of 5, you start to understand language. You start to actually form sentences and, and have conversations. Mm-hmm. And at the age of 67 is where you really peak at the amount of vocabulary you learn. 67. 67. So we are still learning all types of vocabulary. Wow. And so at that age is really when you stop being able to retain vocabulary. Okay. Right? So like learning new words takes a lot more for you to be able to grasp. Gotcha. Right now I can Google a word and be like, oh, yeah, it totally makes sense. And I'm going to remember that. But mm-hmm. at that age, it just starts. To, your brain starts to slow, slow down. down and being able to retain information. At the age of 15 is when you first start to really gain the task of remembering and problem solving. So you think about like vocabulary words you were learning when you were in high school. High school is when you really start to re- retain and understand and remember things. And that's also really at that age in high school, you start to learn what you want to do, right? You start yeah. to really grasp what, what like, because when you're in middle school, there might be some skills that you're learning and knowing, like let's say all the different things you have to learn in school, sciences, maths, Englishes, all the things. Right. But in high school, you really start to pick one of those right. and go towards it. Um, and so at the age of 15 is when you first start to grasp those problem solving skills. And so it really makes sense that we go and teach at this time right? yeah. about relationships. Because at this time, you were talking about being able to choose who you love. Right. At this time, for a young person... They're starting to gain that skill. But just now, just at the age of 15, they're starting to gain this process of understanding problem solving. But it's not until you're 25. So 10 years, 10 years in the making, it takes to truly understand and respond to normal rewards. So the reward process and resiliency and all that good stuff of understanding consequences versus reward and understanding okay. how much is this going to be a consequence versus how much of this is going to be a reward. And then impulses and planning to reach a goal. And recognizing peer pressure. So there's all of that at 25. That up until you're 25 is really when your brain has formulated those things. So you can be working on that in that 10 year frame, but it's not until you're 25 that your brain fully starts to recognize recognizing peer pressure at 
25. So you think about, like, <laughs> think back. If you are an adult listening to this podcast right now, you think back to where you were in high school and college and where you were pressured and gave into it. And it's interesting. I hear a lot of adults say, oh, man, I wish I would have done that. Well, when you look at the brain and, and the, how it's maturing and it's so it's, it's such a growth stage at that point in your life, it's not to say that you can just be like, it was okay for you to do those decisions, but it makes sense as to when you fell for those things or yeah, made not absolutely. great decisions because your it's, brain's not developed. Yeah, when you said that, I was like, oh my goodness, that's why That's why I let this person talk me into that yeah, or this. Yeah, and yeah, sure. Yeah, wow. So the one quote that I stole from um, that specific article um, is that neurobehavioral, morphological, neurochemical, and pharmacological evidence suggests that the brain remains under construction during adolescence, which is that time frame, that 10 year, I mean, adolescence is a little bit longer than that, but really adolescence ends in your mid twenties. And so your brain is still fully under development, fully under construction. I love that. I like that term of under, under construction, construction, right? Yeah. Because it's, you know, you're, you're, you're gaining knowledge, you're losing knowledge, you're learning things. Um, along the way, you're just kind of going along the way at this point in life and your brain is still developing and it really is still developing until you're 67. So there's just that time frame, that 10 year time frame. It's a pretty big time frame. Right? Yeah, it 10 is. years of your brain learning to develop. And so I think that's why learning this personality color test is something that can help a teenager understand that, you know, there's some things that they need to work on. And, and, and even adults. I mean, I know a lot of adults who uh, teachers that I have to take this personality color test and they're like, that makes so sense as yeah. to why they did certain things. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's one of the first things we do when we get new staff Absolutely. is we sit at the <laughs> lunch table and we're like, Hey, have you taken this personality test? Cause we want to learn more about who they are and how, how they function so that we can understand them and yeah. help them yeah. learn and grow. And I would say that's about any personality test. We use this one because it's, Pretty simple. You know, mm -hmm. it usually takes 10, 15 minutes for the students to grasp it and fill it out. And there's some that, you know, there's Myers-Briggs, and I know you've already done a podcast on. On the Enneagram. Enneagram. Yeah. Um, there's a new one out that I don't remember the title of that is um, more work-focused and career-focused, so it can help you kind of understand where someone is in terms of leader or follower. Um, yeah. So there's so many out there. They're all... They're all just self-awareness tools, though. They're that, not... Yeah, and that's that's the point I was going to is it, I would put a disclaimer on personality tests that... It's not supposed to define a person. Right. Or put them in or a put bubble. The, yeah, I was going to say a box. Yeah, yeah, put them in a box, bubble. Yeah, yeah same thing. Um, it's self-awareness. Yeah. And, and, and relationship awareness, too. You know, there's been so many times that Nathaniel, my husband, and I will call each other out. Um, but like, you're, you're just getting a little crazy right now. Or I, Unfortunately, my yellow areas of growth shine more than my orange um, because I care too much sometimes. It's yeah. Yeah. Um, and like, especially when I apologize 40 times for nothing. I do the same it's thing. It's it yellow. drives my husband crazy. Yeah. It's and, a fantastic call it out. Well, and I've noticed Thaddeus. So Thaddeus is my three and a half year old. He does the same thing. Yeah, he watches and I'm you. like, is he doing it because he sees me doing it? Is he doing it because that's just him? Does he think he's in trouble? But yeah. constantly he's like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Like, yeah. you don't have to be sorry for that, yeah. bud. Like, you didn't do anything wrong. And I continuously say that, but I'm like, this Maybe is because of me. me. Right. This is because yeah, of me. Sure. So sometimes, you know, that... That will lead to discussion sometimes in the classroom, too, when I say, um, and maybe not this lesson, but throughout it, you know, you got to be careful if you have young people around you because they're watching you. And sometimes it really is a great self-reflection tool to hang out with a toddler or oh a young goodness. person. Yeah. Because they are. They're, they're, they're little mirrors, and they will watch you. And um, sometimes when they do things, it's like, wait a second. So that's something I actually um, saw on some social media site recently uh, was a mother who said, Anytime my child wants to take a picture of me, I will let them because they are learning self-awareness and confidence from me. Mm -hmm. And so when you say you're ugly or when you say, no, I'm too fat, or when you say X, Y, Z about yourself, they're going to probably start having that self-awareness about themselves. Too. Oh, they're I love that because things. thinking back, I got a lot of those traits from my mom yeah. who was very... Probably a little... Yeah, <laughs> but she she hated her look. Yeah, she hated yeah. everything about That's herself. Right. Um, she just let that shine through. I mean, yeah. she was she was definitely she's an eight on the enneagram, which was like somebody who is very strong and um, passionate and willing to stand up for others. But she didn't like herself. 
And it's a, it's a, it's a major area of growth. You know, I think, I think at some point in life, all of us struggle with that, you know, to go back to you saying, sometimes I wish I was an orange. Uh, a lot of times red personalities, when they get that score, they're like, Oh, I'm a red. And they get really kind of down about being a red. Right. Because unfortunately, a lot of times they, they, areas they see growth, the negative, yeah, that area of growth, um, shines a lot more than the actual strengths. Mm -hmm. And it's simply because they're very strong little people. And so I usually will laugh and say, you listen, I would want you to be in charge because you're going to make decisions and you're not going to care what decisions hurt people or not because they need to be made. Right. You wouldn't want me to be in charge as a yellow personality because I would never make a decision. Right. It would never happen. I, you would never want yellow personalities to be in charge of the country because no laws would be put into place. No X, Y, Z, you know, nothing right. would ever happen. That's why I don't want to be in charge like a CEO sure. or an executive yeah. director. I don't want that role yeah. ever. Yeah. And the reason for that is I don't want to be the one to make the tough decisions. I respect that they have to be made. Yeah, yeah. And I understand that a lot of times it's a lot of going back and forth and trying to figure out what is best for everybody sure. and then just kind of making a compromise wherever you have to. Yeah. I respect that. Sure. I don't want to do sure. it. Well, and I think that that's uh, yet again where this kind of test can help you both in relationship decisions and career decisions because... You know, as an orange personality, I have a little bit of leadership trait because um, I think it's one of the things that I really enjoy about being orange yellow. Um, and this is something that, yet again, I, you know, a lot of people see me as confident, but I, you know, I have my things I struggle with too. Right. But one of the great things about my orange yellow balance is, is that the orange personality in me has that leadership quality of people want to follow me because of my charisma. But my yellow personality gives me a little bit of humility and helps me be a follower too. And mm -hmm. so finding that balance of both. Yeah. And and so I've always said too, I, I make a great assistant because I can help make solid decisions when needed, but I don't want to be in charge of the full decisions. Yes. And yeah. so I think that that's a real balance between having yellow as a second personality color because it does give you that follower mentality. But here's what's interesting about personality colors too. And this is just an area of growth thing. When it comes to, like, let's say some of the more places that teens have had some rough experiences growing up, sometimes that does shape mm -hmm. what personality colors they are at that point in their life. So, for instance, the majority of teens I know who are in trouble with the law are orange or red personalities, sometimes yellow. And here's what's interesting about that it's all one part of the scale. So orange personality is one of their major areas of growth is prone to addiction because they're always seeking the next high. Okay. Red personalities have trouble with anger because they don't know how to control it. And mm -hmm. so a lot of times when they don't get their way because they're very leadership mentality of I want it my way or the highway, they get angry and they act out. Yellow personalities are go with the flow type of people. Peacemakers are agreeable. So if they're with the wrong crowd, they're just going to do whatever to fit in with that crowd. Right. So those three personalities, I often really have to hit hard on those that like, Hey, recognize this because yet again it doesn't put you in that box but i want you to understand that as a red personality you're gonna have some anger issues and you're gonna need to learn mindfulness skills to be able to recognize that yeah and not lash out on people. right Yellow personalities understand you're prone to having people walk all over you um yes it, 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 <laughs> right right and me too me too and, and so you need to just recognize that and so that way you can be a little bit stronger in your mm -hmm. relationships and orange personalities, watch what you're doing <laughs> and what you're allowing yourself to be influenced by. Because, you know, orange personalities often are influencers. Right. And by being an influencer, you're also being influenced. And so it, it really does, um, for a young person whose brain is just starting to develop problem-solving skills and recognition skills of who they are, I think this is a pivotal moment for them. And usually this lesson and lesson four that talks about brain chemicals and how they fall in love are light bulb moments for the students of, oh, that's why I feel this way. Right. Or, oh, that's why I react this way. And, this is, and it's not that there's anything wrong inherently with them, but that there's just areas of growth. Yeah. You know, we all have things that we need to recognize are, I can't control this part of me because it's a natural tendency that I have. What I can't control is what I do with that. Right. I would love to, maybe you might be the perfect person for this, to do a video podcast of the brain chemicals yeah. and actually show our glitter brain activity sure. because I think that that would help even adults listening to this podcast oh understand 
why they make some decisions sure. that they make or don't see certain red flags in a sure. relationship. It definitely opened my eyes when I saw it. Sure. Yeah, I used to joke and say that I had a two-month curse when I was in high school because I dated a lot of people. And after about two months, I'd be like, mm, no, nah, because See I later. recognize yeah. that, like, I don't really have. But often it was because, in my brain, I think partially because I'm an orange personality, that I would just get tired of things. That sounds awful, people that are listening. <laughs> I didn't get tired of the people. I got tired of you. I got tired of the relationship. <laughs> the, you know, one of the things about glitter brain is that when you start to fall for someone, you get giddy. Mm-hmm. You get all these really great feelings. And those, they wear off, you know, and that you can always shake them back up in your relationships. But I would start to see a person more clearly is the thing is I wouldn't get tired of them, but I would see that we weren't really meshing. Right. Uh, as, a, as a romantic relationship. And often it was just the giddiness of, ooh, I like this person. Yeah. And then after about two months for me, I was like, mm, nah. But the problem with that, a lot of people especially at that point where they're just now learning problem-solving skills, get blinded by all the chemicals in their brain. And based on their personality especially, will feel attached and feel like they can't leave or that they don't want to leave. Mm -hmm. And Melissa, our boss, one of the most profound things she said to me about breakups once as a glitter brain ending was, often people miss the routine that they've built with a person more than the person. It's like, oh, that's so, that's so true, good. Right? Yeah. That's so good. Because we do, we, we want these things based on our personality, based on our natural inhibitions, but they're not always good for us. Yeah. The other one that would be good for a video is the beads lesson. Yes. Right? Yeah. So the beads, just as a general overview, because we're audio, not visual right now, is um, this idea that there's going to be a lot more people in your life who are not a good fit for you than those who are a good fit for you. It doesn't mean that those people are bad. Because I've dated a lot of people who weren't a good fit for me that were decent human beings. Great people. Yeah. Just not a good fit for me. And, again, the personality color test can help you recognize who's going to be a good fit. Not all personalities mesh well together. Like a red and a yellow would not be good together. Because no. reds are controlling and yellows yeah. go with whatever. Mm-hmm. Two oranges probably wouldn't be good because nobody would ever get a word in. They would just be talk, 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 talk. Nobody to listen. Yeah. Nobody to bounce off. They'd be the life of the party, though. Right, but they but they, they have to have those other personalities to mesh with um, in order to shine. Sure. Yeah. yeah, we have yeah. two coworkers here that are probably both a little bit of a little bit of orange, but have another co that's very closely related. Uh huh. Um, that helps balance that out. Mm-hmm. So that's what I would say about two colors that are similar. I often get that. Um, I had two. I had a boy come to me once and say, "Well, I'm a blue, and my girlfriend's a blue. What do you think about that?" And I'm like, "Here's what I'll tell you. I'm not saying it won't work, but both of you are going to have to struggle with communicating." Because right. that's just a natural blue thing. A natural blue tendency is to struggle communicating feelings. So if both of you are struggling with that, you, one of you, is going to have to be the person to step, to step out up. and step up and say, we need to talk about this. Otherwise, you're just going to keep shoving stuff in, shoving stuff mm-hmm. in, and you're never going to talk. So yet again, what it boils down to is self-awareness. Right. Um, which as a young person with your brain just starting to develop, is a really, 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 really great skill that I would encourage anyone out there who is a young person listening to start working on. You're not going to have self-awareness at 15, 16, 17, no. 18, even I think, honestly, <laughs> it takes an entire lifetime to fully know Absolutely. yourself, your sure. motivations. And I think they change over time. Sure. Or yeah, so even that, with who you're with sometimes. Well, and that's what I was going to say. Um, our boss, actually, she is a... Very natural yellow-blue as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and my husband is as well, so it's funny. Um, we got a lot of, I'm, I, me and my orange, I've adopted all my little blue personalities, right? Um, a lot of extroverts adopt introverts. Um, yeah. It tends to be what I do. And I think part of that is because, as an orange, I need somebody to hold me down. <laughs> you know? Yeah. As an extrovert, I need somebody who's going to hold me down and, and bring me back down to earth. And sometimes I need to pull them out. <laughs> but, but I would say that, naturally, she's blue, but because she has got this director position, she would tell you the color red, which is that leadership mentality, has risen mm-hmm. in this leadership role because it had to. Right. So you are almost always going to be, that major color that you get is almost always going to be your top color. But all the other ones are mm-hmm. likely to change throughout time. Your right. strongest and your smallest, right? That's why we have them focus on the sixes and the ones. Your strongest color is almost always going to still yet be the strongest color. Your weakest color is almost always so good. But those color. middle colors can kind of bounce all over the place. Well, yeah. Who you're with, who you're surrounding by, and what job you have, especially. Your career can focus on a lot because, you know, sometimes you have to go out of your comfort zone because 
I'll give you an example. As an orange personality and a yellow personality, I don't see myself as a leader because I have flaws and my yellow personality tells me I'm not. But sometimes I have to realize and embrace that I have more leadership qualities than what I realize. Right. And so that red personality is probably a lot stronger than what I give it credit for. Right. And who I am. But that has to also do with where I am and what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, and also putting myself into, pushing myself to go to my fullest ability. Right. Because um, I can just get comfortable where I am. But sometimes we have to jump out, out of our comfort zones if it's a good peer pressure. Yeah. So there's good peer pressure and bad peer pressure. And really, with these color personalities, the areas of growth can help you recognize this. It's really hard as a teenager to recognize what is good peer pressure and bad peer pressure, especially based on color. Um, so if, like, for an orange personality, good peer pressure for me would be, like, my per- like somebody hyping me up to shot for the basketball team. Okay. Because maybe I'm not that great at basketball, but they want me to be on the team because they think I have growth. That's mm-hmm. good peer pressure. Bad peer pressure would be, as an orange personality, somebody being like, hey, come to this party because it's going to be fun and all the other basketball players are going, and I think you could be the life of the party. That's bad peer pressure. But my fun orange personality is going to be like, oh, yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. And so you got to be careful with, you know, recognizing what your strengths and how peer pressure can affect those strengths and what are your weaknesses and how peer pressure can affect those weaknesses. Because as a weakness, one of the major pitfalls of an orange is prone to what's the next big thing. Yeah. And so if I allow somebody who's maybe not the greatest influence to come in and push me to do things that aren't great for me because I have that weakness. Or if I let people run all over me and just go with the flow. Yeah. You're going to have that weakness shine yeah. brighter than your strength. Yeah. And I have. Oh, sure. Yeah. I think all of us yellow personalities have done that. <laughs> and I was in a uh, abusive situation for a little over a year uh, because of that yellow personality and, and uh, very manipulative of, I just didn't recognize it as manipulation because my yellow personality was, well, I need to be here for this person. I need to take care of them. Yeah. And I didn't see that me taking care of them wasn't actually me taking care of them. It was me kind of being stuck in this cycle of manipulation. Right. So yet again, self-awareness. Right. Right. Self-awareness is, is like, and I, and I totally agree with you. And I like that you said that it is a lifelong process. It's a marathon, not a sprint. You're not going to know yourself in a day, but you can work on becoming more aware of who you are. And, and I, had, I had a friend of mine who once said a quote to me that I usually say when I teach this lesson of uh, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. And that's a big part of relationships and personalities, too, of um, careful who you surround yourself by. Yeah. Yeah, I've learned that over time that who I surround myself with really changes my mindset on things. So, you know, we have a group text, whereas, like, if I'm really struggling with something, I might send a text message out to four or five friends. Sure. And... Those are the people who lift me up. Those are the people that are part of my prayer circle. Those are the people who really know me and my personality and what I need to hear. So I, you know, I have to surround myself with the right people. Or if I, if I send that message to the wrong person, then I'm going to get. Because you spiral. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm just going to go down, down, down. Yeah, it's not good. Um, And it's taken me a really long time to realize who those people are in my life, to recognize them. Who are your green beads? Yeah. Which makes no sense to you listeners, but uh, I'll let you have our class when you get it. But the green beads are the people who, when you surround yourself by people who are positive and lift you up. And here's just something as a side note about that little visual and what Becky just said is, People who are positively influencing you are going to be people who make you feel good, who inspire you, who support your dreams, and may speak truth into your life, but in a positive way. Mm-hmm. They're not going to tear you down. They're going to lift you up, even if sometimes that means telling you hard truths that you need to hear. Right. People who make you feel bad, people who don't give you hard truths, but belittle you and make you question your authenticity, those are not people who are good for you. At any point where you feel like a friend is tearing you down, you probably should cut ties with that person. As hard as it is sometimes, you got to rip it like a band-aid. The people in your life who tear you down should be people in your life. Right. You know, people that support you, again, now, there's a difference between telling hard truths that lift you up and just being plain made. Right. Like, Absolutely. Because I could come to you if I recognize there was something that you were doing that I didn't necessarily agree with. Let's just make a false scenario for a second. Let's say I saw that you were drinking and you had uh, a family who 
has had a struggle with alcoholism in the past. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between me coming up to you and being like, hey, Beck, you know, let's talk for a second. I'm really worried about you. Right. And, um, you know, this could really, I feel like this can make you spiral Mm -hmm. um, in a way that wouldn't be very positive. And I know that you have strength and potential. um, And I know that you're a blue, a yellow. And so you might, I might be recognizing that you're going with some people that aren't great for you. I just want to know that um, I'm here for you. But I don't think the decisions you're making great. Compared to... If I was just like, why would you do that? You right. know that's stupid. Mm-hmm. Like, you obviously don't know what's best for you. Exactly. Those are completely different scenarios. Right. And I would um, be more willing to listen to somebody, like, scenario one, who was there explaining that they care for me and they just want to make sure I'm okay. Compared then to just tearing. Number two, I would be like, forget you. Yeah, sure. I'm going to do what I want. Like, you, don't, what I want. you can't tell me what to do. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yet again, uh, you know, and one of the things that it really does help romantic relationships or long-term relationships with, uh, like I said, calling, my husband and I call each other all the time. Like when I am apologizing 42 times or if I'm just feeling very self-loathing, um, I'll be like, all right, yellow, can you calm down? <laughs> Compared to when a husband procrastinates until the night before to finish something that's due the next day and he's up till 2 a.m. I'm like, well, mm-hmm. maybe your blue needs to play in a little bit better. Right. So, you know, it, it, those are completely different scenarios of instead of tearing each other down and being like, of course your yellow would do this. That's sympathy. Yeah. I'm silver lining something. Empathy is, hey, I'm recognizing your yellow shining a little bit. And that area of growth that you have, love yourself a little more. You know, those are completely different scenarios. And so, yeah. Um, yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. Good stuff. Do you have anything else that you want to make sure the listeners know or hear before we close today's podcast? Um, I think that there's two really thing, two things to, to remember. Let's do a strength and a weakness of personality double tests or personality tests in general. I will give the disclaimer yet again that when you do a personality test, don't let that put you in a box. Right. Um, you have to be very careful of that because sometimes you can... And that goes for horoscopes, that goes for BuzzFeed quizzes, that goes <laughs> for quizzes. personality tests, that goes for all these things that sometimes we can You don't have things. to be Swiss cheese if BuzzFeed says that you're Swiss cheese. <laughs> if, you're, if, you, if your BuzzFeed test tells you your dog should be a doctor, that doesn't mean that you look at your dog for advice. You know, it's just all <laughs> the, you know, sometimes you can do these quizzes or personality tests or horoscopes and let those define you in a way that makes you become almost obsessed with them, mm-hmm. don't do that. You know, use these as a tool, not as a definition. You know, it should be a tool of self-awareness. I like that. And so that, you know, without knowing your style, you might think that it's your way or the highway, but use personality tests as a tool for those four things that I mentioned. One is to help you know yourself more. It's to give you humility, to embrace who you are. It's to give you tolerance that people give on your everlasting nerves. And it's to help you in your relationships. It's not to put you in a box or to define you. It's just not there to help you out and, and be able to recognize your areas of growth and your strengths and embrace those things. Okay. Good stuff, Cassie. Yeah. Becky, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks. Well, that's it for us today, guys. Thank you for joining us on the podcast. Please make sure to visit our website at missionwv.org to learn more about foster care or adoption in the state of West Virginia or about our Healthy Relationships curriculum. If you're interested in learning more about fostering or adopting outside of the state of West Virginia, we ask that you visit adoptuskids.org.